You're recording, right? Yeah, it's starting. I'm just getting to the levels. Right, right, yeah, that, that's my thing. I asked if we're recording. <laughs> are you rolling? <laughs> right, are we recording? You're listening to La Crica Podcast, and now here's Rick, Chris, Joel, and Bago. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. You're, listening You're listening to La Crica Podcast, 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 Podcast live with Brian and Jamie Coakley. <laughs> yeah. Is that yours? With your oxycontins in there? <laughs> With you. Oh, I'm not going to cuss in front of my niece. Stay in school. Stay in school. Let me tell you about school, okay? There's. I love you. Never trust. Never trust a Gaborno that you're not related to. Oh, Chumley's here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm talking about right there. Familia, huh? All right, let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to tell you a story about a little man. He did his life in the air, in the garbage can. Until he met that woman, she going to tear him apart. He needs a brand new life. He needs a brand new start. To... Baby, you got a problem. Homeboy come up to me, right? I said, what's up? I thought what you need. Says, what's say I got me a little problem. Well, be no baba towel. I need a brand new life. Need a brand new star. Just a little Yes. Baby, you got a problem. You got a problem. I got what you need. Brand new start. Life on the edge. Living it out on the edge. Life on the edge. Well, that dude come up to me right. He pulled the hair over his eyes. Red up, spread his legs. He said hi. Man, I got me a little problem. You take the big fall, man. If you could just let me 20 with an eye. I'll get up to the road, old man. Baby, you got a problem. You got a problem. I know what you need. Brand new stock. So what happened with that? So um, that's off. Uh, that's a track off an album that we haven't released yet. We've been kind of saving it because we had the documentary and we had the double album. We didn't want to like throw another album in right at the same time and just confuse everybody as to what was going on. But um, we knew when we were going to make the documentary that we needed to re-record the tracks because the original tracks were lost, the masters were gone. Mm. It was going to be a nightmare. So um, about six months of back and forth we should go in a studio and do them right and, da, 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 da. and you know Gabby was sick everybody's got jobs and families and I'm like there's no way you guys are gonna 
it'll take too long. Like we don't have that much time. We gotta get the the tracks done. And you guys are best live. So we had done some stuff with another project of ours called Intersecting LA, where we basically rolled in, set up gear. We have a great um, producer engineer that knows how to do this, and we uh, we we track the rehearsals we ran through the set twice and recorded everything you know everything mic'd up separately but essentially live and then we did a show that night and we played two sets so we had four different uh four different versions, versions of, of the, the same song and from then the whole night he wow. was able to cut it all together and edit it together and mm-hmm. and make a cool live record out of it so i said i think we should try something like that and um, and then you guys can come in and do overdubs or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so that's what what that's what these uh, what you just listened to was. Those were the original live recordings. The guys showed up for this show that they were going to play that night at Fusion in Huntington Beach. And they got there at 10 a.m. and we mic'd everything and they played 20 tracks all day basically before the show. <laughs> right. Well, that's what the album that came out, the vinyl, the double vinyl. That's the whole day. Oh wow. Doing those songs on that same stage, oh, and wow. then this album is just the show that happened later that same night mm-hmm. on the same gear at the same place but it was just like um, everything was mic'd up so we were like yeah it was all ready to go already mic'd up from the and, recording yeah. sessions so we you just left track it. it all yeah, and, yeah. I've serious. listened to all your albums I mean like all of them um, and as far as the Sonics go I mean this is just a night and day difference I mean this is this is like I could compare this to like Van Halen 1984 how it captured the live essence right of the music um, and it really did. It really like, like you were there. Like you close your eyes, and I mean, it sounds like a live album. Yeah. It sounds and and it just the other, other ones just didn't do you guys justice. I mean, it just sounded a little like a little lackluster. Yeah. But this album is just completely like a kick in the head from the first song and the slap in back of the head to the last song. You know? Right. And 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 the lot this this like live album. The, the live album that we're going to release like in about a week that it's um it's even more raw than that as you could just hear oh, yeah. and it's got everything that Gabby's in like cause instead of trying to sanitize it and go okay this track's here this track this track let's cut out all of the crap that Gabby says for an hour you know because sometimes Gabby goes off on tangents he used to right and uh, this has it all uncut just complete Gabby-ness all the way through so it's awesome it's really cool yeah, well, what happened was we, you know, we, we did the tracks all day, and then we um, had him just record the show, and then we were listening to it, and I was like, we should just release this as it is, almost like a comedy record, you know, back in the day when you know, like, you'd have like a really cool comedy record, because so much of the live show for the Tramps was Gabby's <laughs> antics. <laughs> Good let me in. <laughs> I'm gonna bark until you let me in. Um, any, anyway, so it was so like so much of a live show was just and all the crazy things that Gabby would say from stage, and people talked about that when we were doing the documentary that he would draw you in and he'd talk to people in the crowd and everybody felt like they were part of the show in a way. So I was like, it would be really cool, I think, to just release this, and we're only gonna do it as digital release, but start to finish. No edits, like he said. Every word that Gabby uttered from the beginning of the set to the end of the set is there. And we're not even... We're going to put markers, so if you want to scroll to your favorite song or whatever, you can. But when you press play, it's just going to play like a live show would from start to finish. It's truly... There's truly nothing else out there like that. I mean, it is completely... Like cutthroat original man in every sense of. Oh the yeah, word. totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. And um, what I was gonna say too, the seeds of how we recorded that um, actually started in 1992. We were we went in to do Tombstone Radio because we knew our first record didn't sound right. You know what I mean? We were like, ah, oh, you know, it's okay, but it's just not really what we were looking for. We went in to do Tombstone Radio. The record label goes, come into the studio, set up. And we're gonna do a pre-production, and we were we were kind of like, what's that? <laughs> we didn't even know what that meant, you know. Right. Yeah. We just set up in a room it, at the same studio we did our records, but everything was in the same room, mm-hmm. and we we jammed it out the whole album live, wow. and then they're like, okay, listen to these tracks and pick the songs and stuff, and that those tracks ended up. Then we go back and and re-record it all mm-hmm. and fuck it all up, <laughs> <laughs> and make it too sanitized, right? Mm-hmm. Those th- that cassette tape sounded bitchin mm-hmm. and i was johnny and i would just be like why does this tape 
obviously the vocals weren't right on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Things were were wrong on, about it. But it was like, why does this one have the power? Mm-hmm. And then and we really like just realized over the years that it was like that bleed of having, you know, you you try to mic them, you close mic the guitar and you close mic the drums, but you have them in the same room and there's a there's bleed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that bleed gives it just like a way more power. Mm-hmm. It's something yeah. about it. Yeah. Know, it's, that's when it's too structured. You, you know, it's, it's like it's yeah. like having, it's like yeah. having a Richard Pryor live album and not having him say "motherfucker." You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got it, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> so we don't. So we so we don't confuse you guys because, like I said, so the li- the live record that we're talking about, where we you know didn't cut out any of Gabby's antics. That's actually Gabby wanted to call have be called. Cadillac tramps off their walkers because they were getting so old. <laughs> and he wanted a walker with like all the mod shit, all the mirrors and the and the, the oh, just all the crap that they put on those mod scooters. And but then, a walker like that. Yeah. So, so we actually um, we weren't able to get like a photograph of that but i have a great artist that drew drew it up for me we decided to do it like an old punk rock flyer just black and white with everything handwritten nice. like a like nice. a show flyer because it yeah. is a show that's flyer. perfect yeah it's totally and it's got this and then it's got this walker with all of these uh rearview mirrors and stickers <laughs> and everything plastered yeah. all over it but that's the one that's not released yet we're getting ready to release that for the holidays and that's so that's cadillac tramps off their walkers and it's only going to be available for digital but we're going to make the artwork available too so you could put it up like an old school flyer if you want to have it and put it with your collection. But then the other one that we were talking about where Brian was talking about, you know, setting everybody up in the room and tracking the basics together Mm -hmm. so that the energy and the bleed is there. That was the double vinyl album that we released middle of October, which was, it's called Don't Go. Mm. And that's more of the studio quality. So the basic tracks were recorded live, but then they did go back in and overdub some guitars Mm -hmm. and Gabby re-sang all of his vocals. So it's got a little bit more of the polished sound. But like you said, it definitely captured the power and energy of the tramps. It was very, very powerful from when... How did the dialogue get started for doing the documentary and the the double album and the live album? How did did the ideal... Whose idea was it to to get it going? Well, Brian had had been kind of... uh, complaining over the years you know that the tramps were really beginning to be forgotten in the orange county music scene you know the oc weekly would do the best 10 punk rock bands out of orange county and the tramps wouldn't be there or the best guitar players to come out of orange county and johnny and brian would not be there and he was like you know because the music is lost we're, we're going to be forgotten. He's in. He's like, I really wish somebody would do something about this. And, you know, we kick it around a little bit. Blah, blah, blah. And then um, they played with Tiger Army at um, the, the Grove. Grove. And Gabby had had surgery on his eye because he was having complications from diabetes. And just, you know, he was falling apart. And um, he'd had surgery on his eye like the day before. And, of course, Gabby would show up and play no matter what. And he, he that was the first time that I saw him where I was like, oh, my God. Hmm. He is really not going to be here for much longer. And if anybody's going to do anything, we need to like we need to do it now. And and the mu- there was nothing. There was no music. There was no video. There was nothing. Um, so I had been kind of working a little bit in production, and I'm a storyteller in a lot of ways anyway. So I was like, "Fuck it, let's do it." Mm-hmm. And Brian's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, well, you do realize that we're going to lose like $100,000 on this. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to be a ton of work and we'll probably hate each other. But at the end of the day, not just for us, but for the band and for the fans. And then also, you know, Gabby has a son that survived him. And I was like, I really want to make sure that his son grows up being able to see his dad and how much his dad loved him and all the, the the beautiful things that he gave to the world even though he's a complicated person that there was so much good and beauty in him as well so those were kind of like the main three things we were like if we can make it in the bands happy and we can make it in the fans are happy and presley will have something he can put in and watch when he's missing his dad and see that love there then whatever it'll be worth it so yeah and we, we just kind of jumped into it we just started i mean it was like let's just start and then uh, it would be jamie would say uh, I think I need to buy another camera or I think I need to I can't monitor off this camera because we were using like the, those 60D's. Uh, 60D Canon oh, 60D's yeah. you yeah. know yeah. and the thing one of them would shut off every like 15 minutes or whatever wow. it'd be if the interview went too long it'd be like oh hold on my camera shut off Ooh, in the middle yeah. of it and it was just you know she did all that the cinematography but 
like you know that first sizzle that was made to, that was going around the it was like a teaser thing that was at, made as much to convince the other tramps mm. to go along with it as it was to get the for the kickstarter and all that it ended up being great to help get money for that but they didn't at first they were just like yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. Mm, I don't know. And then when Jamie would like try to film them talking, and they would just shut up and turn their head. They were total jerks. Uh, you know, I think people when you're you guys are musicians, so you know people are always going to say they're going to do stuff. They were not super stoked on it. And I'm Brian's wife, so and I, we actually had a, a guy come up to us at a show that we played a couple months ago, and he was like, "Hey, I ought to talk to you." And I'm like, "Okay." He's like. I heard through the grapevine that Brian Coakley's wife was going to make a documentary about the Cadillac Tramps. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> that's going to suck. It's going to be all about Brian Coakley. And he's like, and for like a year and a half, I was just ready to hate it. And my wife made me go to a screening. And he's like, man, I got to tell you, you did such a good job. You totally captured the Cadillac Tramps. And it's not all about your husband. Although he's in there, and that's cool. <laughs> but he was like, thank you. I really appreciate it. But I think that maybe the Tramps were thinking that it would be only Brian's point of view because I was Brian's wife. And so there was some trepidation about that. So we basically had to make that sizzle. And we had everybody over to the house. And we're like, OK, this is what I'm talking about. So I could prove to them that what my vision was and that I could actually do it, that I wasn't yeah. just talking shit. So, and they were crying. <laughs> yeah. Everybody that we got done. What do you guys think? And there was, you know, cause that was also to get them to sign their releases and all the crap, yeah. you know? And they were just like, where do I sign? <laughs> everybody had tears in no, their eyes. You had everybody. I mean, even I was, yeah. After watching it, it was, it, well, yeah, it the, the movie, it's yeah. well, well, then the other thing was the movie actually got made and, Gabby gets his copy, and and we send him a copy, and he watches it like by himself when he's like at home, just kind of lonely at home watching it, and didn't like the movie at all, and it was like, what? Wow. What? What's the matter, dude? What do you think? And then so he was kind of stirring up stuff from behind because I think, too, they thought it was going to be a like rah rah piece about the tramps like this is how great we were and this is how awesome we were and this but instead of having like the warts and all approach where yeah there was some shit that went down we did we disagreed on stuff we had our issues so he just kind of felt like it wasn't that cool and then we had that first screening that he got to go to while he was still alive thank god because after that screening complete flip of script he, he freaking loved it kept like he'd he'd have me over and he'd be like yeah man that that just made that helped our legacy and you know he was like yeah. completely changed his mind <laughs> but at first he kind of thought like what's my kid gonna think he's gonna think i'm a bad guy and you know it looks like it's it's saying it was my fault we broke up and i go no it, it didn't really say that it was kind of saying like Johnny and I were going this way, and you were going this way, and we all went three different ways, and totally, and then Adrian from No Doubt says it, if you're not all on the same page, dysfunction, and that's right. totally what, exactly what happened, you know, and, it, and and I didn't like some of the parts, like, I was like, man, Jamie, you're making me look like a dick. <laughs> there was way other, because she does like You don't a, a, need me to do that for you. She, <laughs> you know, somebody, somebody does a two-hour interview, and then you say a lot of shit, and then it's like, that's not the shit I wanted you to fucking put in there. Man. It's the magic of editing. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. We do. We go through the same thing when we're no. podcasting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we yeah, and I mean, for me, it was... Um, I, it, I, w I wanted to tell a higher story so that if you didn't give a shit about punk rock, if you didn't care about the Orange County music scene, if you'd never heard of the Cadillac Tramps, you could watch that movie and be moved by it and get something out of it. I wanted it to try and help the Tramps reach a larger audience. So if I had just done like a traditional straight, you know, a, B, C, D happen in the world of this band, then I felt that it would limit that story. So I really looked for the higher themes of brotherhood, redemption, mm -hmm. addiction. And um, I had the opening sequence is Brian going to visit Gabby in the hospital. Yes. And that actually came to me in a dream. I didn't know how to open the film. And, and I had a dream about it. And I told Brian. And he was like, yeah, that could really work. Um, and then we asked Gabby. And Gabby, you know, he was machismo. He didn't want anybody to see him 
mm-hmm. hurting yeah. or vulnerable. weak or vulnerable. 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 It was really, yeah. really hard for him. And I, we begged and pleaded for about six months, and then he finally uh, let us come in and, and film some of the hospital stuff. And I would be like, well, if it's me, then I just won't go. I'd be like, Brian, when you go visit him, ask him if you can shoot some stuff on the iPhone. I don't even care. We'll use mm-hmm. it. And he would sh- he would sabotage every time. Brian would go, I'm going to film a little of you. And then he would say, like, the most racist, <laughs> he would just, the most homophobic. He would, just, he would blurt out some shit that you, could, like, you couldn't even put on a... In wow. an X-rated movie, like, man, the, it would be like, oh. Fuck. Brian would come back, and I'd be like, "Did you get some footage?" And he would be like, "Yeah." It's and really he'd show funny. Like, you know, Gabby was such a big, strong personality, and he, you know, could really intimidate people, and so it was really hard to get him to do anything that he he didn't want to do. And I just, we just stayed really persistent, and finally by the grace of God and that's you know those those points where you see him in the hospital are tra- really key points to keep that higher story going mm-hmm. and remind you of the gravity of the situation it and did. why everybody was there in that time and without the, the footage it would have not yeah. been nearly as impactful yeah. so we we're grateful he finally let us but it was <laughs> it was not easy it really wasn't but we're so thankful that we have mm-hmm. it now you know it's almost like He's almost been gone. He'll be, he'll pass a year in January, the beginning of January. And Brian and I talk about this all the time because we've been working this whole year. It doesn't feel like he's gone for us. We see him all the time. We hear his voice all yeah. the time. And there was a couple, a little, after the, after the movie came out in the middle of October, Brian kind of hit a little bit of a... A, a sad time for him because it really felt like for him he was staying busy the whole time he hadn't mm-hmm. really processed and he got really depressed and kind of sad for a couple of weeks there just the reality of oh this is the end of the Cadillac Tramp something I've been doing for 30 years with my brothers mm-hmm. and Gabby's gone and the, that's been kind of you know it's rough a long time for sure this is a this is from a, re- a review that I uh, that I typed up after I saw the movie uh, Life on the Edge is such a phenomenal doc I think Jamie and Brian did a phenomenal job putting this together. This doc was every bit as emotional as it was humorous. It was an accurate depiction of the trials and tribulations that a band goes through and overcomes. It was real. It was raw. It was truthful. It was heartfelt and generous. Uh, that's what I got out of it. And uh, it, it definitely, you know, you, you find yourself straying away, you know, from time to time. And it definitely puts things back in a perspective, especially if... Uh, you know, you yourself have been through some traumatic experiences in your life. So, a phenomenal job, I thought. Indeed, indeed. I mean, one of my, I like watching documentaries. That's my thing. And um, one of my favorite documentaries was Some Kind of Monster because I hated Metallica so much. Mm. They made them look like such divas. And this, this automatically, and it, not because you guys are here, but this just like took the place of that to number one because you don't have to be a Cadillac like Knapps fan to love this documentary. In some cases, it might make you Cadillac Traps fan, you know, turn you on to all that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just such an amazing story. I mean, after 30 years of being together, you know, how did you um, get all that storytelling <laughs> into one thing? Because I remember reading something that you said. You said that this wasn't the story of the Cadillac Traps. It was a story of the Cadillac Traps. Correct, yeah. How did you piece this together to put in the film? Well, it was it was Jamie first of all and uh what's Wait. leah gallagher leah gallagher is our is a friend of ours that has always been super cool and helpful and, and goes the extra nine yards every time we ask for any kind of help but she actually watched every single interview so everybody did like an hour and a half she watched about There's 60 to 70 hours oh yeah of footage. Oh, wow. wow yeah so wow. she watched it all and she typed it all out she transposed it all transcribed. so that transcribed mm-hmm. so there's three binders that are like this thick, and it's every interview from everybody. You know, after, because things were revealed that we didn't, you know, you go in, you think, okay, I know the story of the tramps, I was there. And then all these other people say all this crap that I didn't, I wasn't there when that happened. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. So there's all this stuff. So she actually had to go through and, and pick a story, basically, because there was a, it could have taken two or three different turns. Or too many turns, or just been like a, then this happened, then this happened. You've seen that documentary where it just rambles on and Mm -hmm. on and on. (laughs) We we started with a, 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 you know, every good story has a beginning, middle, and end. So I asked Brian, okay, so if you're thinking about your 30 years with the Tramps, beginning, middle, and end, how would you approach that? So we started with, what was it like? 
what happened? What's it like now? So that was like our, you know, first, format. second, and third act, basically. That was the really raw structure. <clears throat> and then we just started doing interviews, and then I looked for themes. If it came up in one interview and it was a great story, but I didn't have anybody else to support it or talk about it, I had to leave it on the floor because a documentary is not mm-hmm. just one person talking about something you want people to clap to uh, Corroborate? Right. Yeah. Corroborate. Corroborate. Yeah. So, what she said. Yeah. So, so I noticed as I did the interviews that there were themes. It, you know, there were things that everybody said. And, you know, one of the things was, wow, it was so cool that they were sober together. Like, that blew our minds. And a lot of sober people saying, it saved my life to have a place to go where I knew there were going to be other sober people and I could have fun. And that came up a million times. So that was obviously an important part of the story. Even though the Tramps originally didn't want to be known as a sober band, it wasn't how they started off. And they resisted it at times being labeled that. It turned out to be one of their greatest strengths when you think about a, a lasting legacy. I mean, mm-hmm. people say, oh, that music changed my life, but the music saved people's lives, like legitimately, and a lot of them. So that was really cool. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so Leia um, transcribed all the interviews, and then I, I had to go through them and organize them and, you know, into a four act mm-hmm. structure. And I, I literally went through, you know, those three binders um, seven mm-hmm. or eight times and highlighted common themes and then pulled time code and then to put the time codes together into an actual script and then my editor went through all the footage and pulled the footage and then we had to see we compiled that into it was about four and a half hours and then from there you just Start keep, editing. you just you know that doesn't look as good that person didn't say it as well you know yeah. and and just keep yeah. You try take, to do that take, taking stuff out yeah. until you have something that that really works. <laughs> they did that cool thing where you know Ace will be talking about something and then somebody else finishes that same sentence because mm-hmm. it came it up flowed. so many times it well. that other people had it in their interviews. Right, exactly. And uh, you know there was su- like sub sub trails that could have gone down. You know, like Mike Bohm, the critic from the L.A. Times. You know, he says, you know, I, I want to say something. And he really wanted to say this in his interview and it didn't make the movie because there was nobody else that brought it up. But he was like, you know, back in those days, the Cadillac Tramps were actually this multi-racial band. Mm-hmm. They had white dudes and Hispanic dudes and stuff. And they were in this band together and it was total harmony. And it was like this total binding force. Mm-hmm. And then... Because the weird thing was, when we first met Gabby, you know, when you, you guys have that thing where it's like, I, I have Hispanic in me, but it's like it's, I've always been culturally white. Mm-hmm. Gabby grew up in Westminster. His family was like split down the middle. And so he, he kind of was a, almost like ashamed of his Hispanic roots at first. When we first met him, mm-hmm. first thing he told me was that he was Italian. Because <laughs> Gaborno, right? He's like, yeah, I'm Italian, and and it was like we watched him totally just become Mr. Gabby, like embrace it, you know. And the manic Hispanic thing brought that around a lot too, with with working with Steve Soto and just going like, you know what? Let's just embrace that part of ourselves, and then obviously other people embraced it too and felt good. It made people feel good about who you are. Like take who you are. Be proud of who you are and just be it and totally take it to the limit, you know? And we, you know, we had that in our band and it was like not something that made the doc, but it would have been, you know, if enough people would have said it, it would have, you know? Yeah. Mike Bohm, he was a critic, music critic for the LA Times and loved the Tramps. And he said, you know, you guys, I noticed it, but, but you guys didn't notice it. We didn't In Orange County where there's so much, you know, perceived racial strife and, you know, Uh, racism against Mexicans Mm -hmm. and Latinos and here you guys were like nobody even noticed it was no big deal and and Brian told me yeah when when I when I first met Mike he wasn't Gabby he was Mike and he was Italian and over the process of the 30 years (laughs) he became and things changed like what (laughs) he was able to embrace his heritage more and then hold up (laughs) like what What then then all of a sudden he was tripping on his Ruka yeah Yeah. all of a sudden he was doing drive-by smiles (laughs) and tripping on his Ruka just when you listen to the the track that we opened with you know he's using all kinds of Spanglish and Orle and he, he really embraced that and he did make people feel proud to be Mexican or to be Latinos Mm -hmm. and he was one of the first to really do that and um, Alex from Alex's bar 
talk to us um, like maybe six months ago. It was right around the time Gabby passed away. And, you know, he just had like a velvet painting commissioned of Gabby that's mm-hmm. up on the wall and Alex is born and everything. But mm-hmm. for him, he said, Gabby totally changed my whole life. He said, I was always ashamed to be Mexican until wow. I, I saw Gabby on stage. And he was so funny and I was so proud mm-hmm. of him. And he made was, it look cool. He <laughs> was embracing it. He was like, it was the first time where I was like, fuck yeah, I'm a Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, you know, and I wish that that had come up sooner and I wish yeah. that it had come up more because that would have been a really cool. But, but again, that, that's a whole nother, I could do like a whole yeah, nother section. documentary whole nother just on. Yeah. Yeah that impact and part two cool the mexican is. years <laughs> <laughs> well gabby used to like we used to we drew like a lot of hispanic people and gabby used to call he'd go oh the taco billies are coming you know <laughs> and like it would be like it's funny but it's like the wrong yeah, person say that up a taco truck he, outside. He, uh, <laughs> actually um when uh rick and i started this um he told me, well, I'm going to start printing shirts again because he used to do T-shirts. Right. And uh, I want you to think of a name for our print company, and I want you to think of a name for this. And I was listening to Mijo goes to junior college in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's when, that's when I thought of the name. I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's call it The Click, like Lika. Yeah. See? So it, that this name is inspired by Gabby. Oh, that's killer. That's that. great. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that legacy will I think that legacy will live not just through the tramps, but also through Manic Hispanic, for sure. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do the, the live show Uncut, mm-hmm. because you really hear some of that come through that you don't get on the on the actual official you know studio record yeah. Yeah. you know the antics and the that 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 uh that flavor mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. not there as much so one of my tra- favorite traps album is a live album yeah. i mean i really love it you know the last time i saw you guys is when we played in rocket for the reunion 2016 yeah that was yeah. the last time i saw you guys right as, as a kind of like traps and um it always takes me back to that you know i'd always relive it through that album mm-hmm. you oh know? the one that's on uh BYO. BYO, yeah, the BYO. Yeah, yeah right. that's a great yeah. record too. And that one actually doesn't have Johnny playing on it. Though. Yeah. That's got Mad Dog, but yeah. he he was great. He did he did a lot of good work, mm. and that was a really good. I think I'm biased. Next to the one that we <laughs> just made, um, that one I think is definitely captures them better than any of the other ones. Oh, before. absolutely, well, they're, absolutely. Sure. they're different animals because the that one that record came about with Chris Martin, who briefly managed the Tramps, and he was friends with all of us, but the idea it's it was a real similar idea it was like the tramps never captured that power of live so let's do a live record mm-hmm. but that that's like a live record that's been re-recorded a bunch of the stuff yeah and a little overdub in there. a little overdubs and all that stuff so this one that's coming out is raw as fuck it's just like straight the straight shit there's one guitar player on this side there's one on that side there's one vocal here there's one vocal you know what i mean yeah we didn't know but yeah i like that record too it's good i like it but did this uh just to hear you just hearing the life on the edge on that live album i mean you could hear the sweat coming down you know yeah, yeah. you get that yeah. you get that that feeling that you're uh yeah you're getting can, your ass kicked in the on, on in the front yeah you can you, 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 on. you can picture you can picture the shitty lighting and you know <laughs> the lights beating down on you and you know oh, the, yeah. red, the red glow yeah. the, the the stale smell of patchouli and old beer yeah. well, it, it wasn't it wasn't the, even in a cool in the crowd club. yeah yeah <laughs> it was at that fusion place in huntington beach oh, which was okay. not like a cool place it was like yeah. adult chucky e. cheese or something <laughs> It was weird. It, really it was a is. weird place. It the ended s- up sounding amazing, though. The room, we yeah. couldn't have asked for a better room. It ended up being a great room to track. And yeah. we just got so lucky on that because wow. we threw a fit. We were like, Scott Tucker was promoting. We're like, we're doing this, Scott. And he's like, ah, they don't want any. <laughs> nobody's here at 10 a.m. And they're like, yeah. Yeah, we need to be here at 10 a.m. <laughs> well, we got to say thanks to Scott Tucker because yes. actually he made it happen. He made the he sound man show up. They ran all the everything was set up and and up at ten o'clock, and we didn't. Oh man, they were so freaking mad at us. <laughs> the manager and everybody were just like sitting there, and they're like, "When are they gonna get out of here?" Because to pack up out of there, yeah, it look. was recording gear and regular gear, so we didn't get out of there till like two in the morning, and they were expecting us out of there by like one at the latest, and it was one of those like. Everyone in the staff. Y'all this never, is really bad radio. They were doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody sees what I'm doing, but I'm making a face. <laughs> and if you saw it, oh, you'd, you'd be bummed out. Yep, it's kind of crazy. What else? I don't know. 
Let them ask me. No, no. <laughs> well, we got we got more questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brian, tell us about how Santos y Sinners began. Oh, well, okay. Okay, that's an interesting one because what happened um, when Gabby got really sick, you know, he had manic, he had the tramps, and then he had a uh, flock of goo goo. Okay. Right. So basically, uh, his dis- he didn't get that much disability. So he was like, he couldn't work. He was way too sick to work. Didn't get too much disability, not enough to survive. So it was like, trying to get like the tramps to play all the time right right he i mean we played some stupid shows really we and and like johnny and the other guys some of those guys would just be like i can't do that one and then you'd see us do a show and it would be like dave stookin would play or whoever would fill it you know because gabby would just be like man we need to play it can we just get fill-ins i had a kind of i i I don't even know if it was intuition or what but i knew that my time with gabby was going to be limited so i was like whatever show you book i'll play it i don't i wasn't ever arguing like no i don't want to do that show or that show but there was only so many took your ego out of it and just were like i'm just gonna show up and be present while i can that was our hang i mean we didn't like you know holidays and stuff i didn't really see him after the first few that when i knew him so it was like our hang was music and so um when he so he calls me and he goes i want to do this band come over I'm, i'm writing some songs and at first it was kind of like he was writing these folk songs and he was he wanted to do like and it wasn't it was cool stuff it was just he wanted to do like a really he would joke around jokingly call it age appropriate music for us right. <laughs> it was just mellow music like a, a couple Elvis Costello covers and he wanted to he wanted to just do a mellow cool kind of a band and then uh he started he was living with EV and he started talking to EV about doing a blues band and so the the mellow thing turned into a blues band and then they were talking about who should we get who should we get and gabby would do this classic thing where you'd go "Hmm, what drummer can we get let's get somebody like i already called jim you know he would like he would just so ev he was talking to ev and he's like what guitar player should we get we should get some shredder blues guy that's and he already called coakley you know (laughs) so ev was like stuck with me you know it was like they they were like okay coakley's doing it i guess whatever gabby says and then uh so you know we started doing it and it was fun and uh but at first we didn't have a name and um ev does this band that he calls the atomic road kings and gabby calls me and he goes ev wants to call it the atomic road kings and i was like oh he already does the atomic road kings already that's already a thing we need our own thing and then we were texting back and forth and it was like i go we got to do something that's like you know take advantage of of what we are man it's like it's like we're Cheech and Chong of music or whatever you know it's like <laughs> let's be like the Santos and the Sinners or whatever you know and it, it we were texting back and forth and it just came about that way that the name came out like that but um it was really truthfully just to have another band for Gabby to play more times during the month and get a little bit more dough really mm-hmm. it right. really came down to like that's his best avenue to make a few bucks here and there Mm-hmm. extra and then we'll make some shirts and he can sell those and keep the dough from that kind of a thing so it was just a revenue thing really and eric von hersen or ev is this amazing harmonica player he's mm-hmm. really fantastic so having him in the band was awesome and then gabby sang lead and they did like classic blues covers but then they gabbyified it you know they kind of punk rocked him out yep. a little bit right. rocked him up a little <laughs> brian came in and then jim and Roe on drums and it was they just you know let's play you know help gabby make some money and brian brian would be like i don't know if i want to do this but i want to see gabby and i know time's limited so he'd like roll out there i love it now (laughs) well and then and then towards the end gabby specifically said to brian like i know we're you're not going to be able to keep doing the tramps but i want you to keep making music and i think you guys should keep doing santos yeah and he said the same thing to evie so it was like you know should we keep going it's like it was kind of weird and then should we get a new singer mm, i don't know uh, who are we going to like put someone else out there and it's like here's the new gabby guy you know or whatever <laughs> that wouldn't work yeah. so uh we just kind of morphed and having chris smith on bass and ev on harmonica puts us like automatically in like 
the real blues dudes, what I right. call the real guys, right. you know? <laughs> and then me and Jim Monroe were like, we're here too. <laughs> Hi. You make it cool. <laughs> yeah. I bring my punk rock baggage to the to the party, so. Nobody does the freak on stage at a blues show like we do. That's <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> How far do you plan, or would you hope Santos e Sinners would go? Oh, for Santos? <sighs> I don't know. Nothing bigger than the best blues band on earth. It'd <laughs> 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 be cool with that. that. That's a very humble outlook. Right. Yes. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. He's loving doing it, but he also goes to me, he's like, I'm, I'm not ready to just play blues. I still want to rock. Like, I still got that fire in me. I want to tear shit up. I want to break stuff. <laughs> yeah. Any projects in the work besides Santos? That's what she, like kind of that's what she's talking about. I kind of am. It's weird. In my mind, I have a total project together. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's mostly in my mind. There's there's songs and there's guys that want to play with me and it's like I'm getting approached by guys here and there and uh, I'm sending them some tracks. Here, what do you think of these tracks? Oh, those are cool. You know, we're doing it's at that stage, you know. But it's one of those things where um, I don't have a ton of time. Uh, and I, people always say that I don't have a ton of time, but really, I mean, I work. I got a regular job that I do. I got a company I run. And finishing and, the documentary, I mean, we really were working all year. And that every was extra another hour job to get the movie out. Yeah. So that just has only been like a month since we released it. Where we're like, oh, we might have half a day this week that yeah. we don't have scheduled that we can actually focus on something else. But he's been playing a lot. It's been really nice. <laughs> I've, I've been writing a lot, a lot of stuff. He's so his guitar a lot. Something's going to come popping out of here uh, sooner or later. But, uh, you know, with Santos, it's like it's like a baby steps. We're going to record some tracks. We've decided that we want to do some originals. So we wrote some originals. We're going to record them. We're just going to take it like one step at a time. You know, right. we, I try to um, not play the regular blues places, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like our best show that we did that I thought was like our best show was uh, that opening up for Throw Rag at Alex's Bar. It was totally sold right. out. It was crazy. We played right. It was, it was us between the pushers and Throw Rag, mm. and it worked. You know what I mean? And it right, was like, right. we're a blues band? Is that really what... Is, I don't think we're just a regular blues band if that worked like that. <laughs> but it did, and it was like, okay, that that's what Gabby had always envisioned. It was be more like, um, you know, like the Red Devils live at the King King right. kind of thing, mm -hmm. where those they could play on, with anybody. They could go to a festival, and it would be like Metallica and the Red Devils and Fish, you know, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's just like, you don't care. So. Is, there, um, is there any um, people you listen to? right now to be inspired to write um yeah there's a ton I, I go backwards a lot i go to my old like go-to's mm -hmm. but um I, i've been listening to some blues obviously just because i'm trying to, to know what's going on but like um he loves the black keys He's i love the black, the black keys, keys. Excellent. this year Excellent. i love the guys that push it so like Black Key guy, you could tell that guy's a roots guitar player and he's a roots singer, but then they push it to this place where it's like, oh, there's pop, there's, mm -hmm. but it's still gritty and it's still raunchy. I like I like Jack White a lot. I like whatever a lot of stuff Jack White does. I love the sounds. I love the the pushing it to the limit there. Nice. Um, Cage the Elephant is probably like my one of my favorite kind of what I would call a new band, even though they're not that new. Mm -hmm. But they're freaking great. If you ever get to see them live, they're amazing. Um, Any BB King in there? Oh, there's a lot of BB King in there for sure. Yes. I, like, I mean, literally, if you look at my iPod, it's like mostly old <laughs> crap like that. But Jimmy Cena from um, Harless Sweetwater's band, uh, he came up to us one night and he goes, "You guys are like the Paul Butterfield band or whatever." <laughs> Man, you guys are rad. And I was like. We are? Cool. And I thought, well, I guess that's a compliment. I don't know. But then I went and li started listening to Paul Butterfield, yeah. and I was like, fuck, we kind of are. Our version of Mojo is actually a lot like Paul Butterfield Band's version. So that's good. I like it a lot. I think he's getting good responses from it. Yeah. yeah that's good. Yeah. You're, you're, you're catching people's ears, and they're like, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like people it. love it. I think it's the combination of, you know, the classic blues songs are impossible not to like unless you just are really destroying them. But then they have, they, you know, 
Brian, everything Brian does, he like kind of puts it through his little fucked up filter and it comes out awesome mm-hmm. on the other end. And he's really good at, you know, he did, can never play anything straight, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he used to, when we were in Wax Apples, I'd be like, we got to do this cover. He's like, I don't do covers. I'm like, what do you mean you don't do covers? He's like, I, don't, I only write, I write too many songs. I don't need to do other people's songs. <laughs> Plus, I didn't know how to play covers. Yeah. <laughs> I was really like <laughs> shitty at it. <laughs> I'd sit there trying to learn how to play a Zeppelin song f- f- for a year. <laughs> and then Mad Dog would go, you're playing that riff wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and actually, they're, they're, that's not a bad influence right there right now. Yeah. Because they're very bluesy. Oh, influence. for sure. Awesome. I love Zeppelin. I, I, yeah, I would love to hear them. I like to like to get their background, ish, you know, what they're influenced by. It's always, they always talk about the blues. Yeah. yeah absolutely. You know, it's just almost like the rock group. Blues. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw um, a documentary uh, at the Limley last week. It's the... Um, Rumble, mm. the Indians Link that rocked Ray. the world. Have you guys seen that? Uh, mm. It's a it's the history of rock and roll and American Indian influence and the American Indian sound on rock and roll. And it talks about Chris. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it, we're all looking at him. First uh, Nation. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm about as American as apple pie and one dollar Chinese food. So. Mm. <laughs> Like those Chinese food. I don't know if they, I don't know how many Chinese food places in, in Orange County they have, but we have the ones here. They sell donuts and Chinese food out of the yeah. same place. And boba. And boba. And boba. <laughs> you can't find a straight Chinese food place anymore unless no. you're on Pico, mm-hmm. Pico yeah. Boulevard in West LA. I'm mm. like, the Jewish people must really love Chinese food because oh, it's yeah. all like Jewish <laughs> places and and Chinese, but it's not like Chinese and sushi. Because yeah. that's it's what like they, legit old school because Chinese. Because that's what they eat for Christmas. It's the only <laughs> place that's open. It's the only place that's open. But if you if you get a chance and Thanksgiving, I'm I could vouch for that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you get a chance to watch this documentary, it's really good and 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 uh, you know the beats that are in rock and roll, mm-hmm. and they talk about how. Natives influenced blues, be, and a lot of it was because of the mixing of the races. Mm-hmm. The, a lot of Native Americans were mixing with slaves or f- newly freed slaves, mm-hmm. and intermingling and making mm-hmm. babies. And a lot of the what what we would call African American music sounds mm-hmm. are actually also Native, Native American, American. Mm-hmm. The, the, the vocal yeah. patterns and all of that kind of I'll stuff it so it's pretty interesting but um, they you know Led Zeppelin obviously and uh, the Beatles oh, yeah. and oh gosh well Jimmy Page's big other? thing was Rumble by the Rolling Gray. Stones yeah. Yeah. yes the Rolling Stones all the you know, yep. yeah. talk oh. about blues is a big influence but it's mm-hmm. actually a lot of Native and jazz. American music mm-hmm. too and, yeah. so. and jazz yes. that's really cool Bonham. <laughs> I just found a new respect for Chris. Uh, thanks. So. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. See, these are all childhood friends. So growing up, being not Mexican but Indian has been very traumatizing. Yeah. <laughs> right. He needs, he needs a hug, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get a hug. Yeah, and he's feather, not dot. Feather. Yeah. Feather. Yeah. Yeah, fe- feather Indian, not dot Indian. That's what he always. He, when I first met him, that's what he told me. He goes, I'm Indian, I'm feather, not dot. Feather, yeah. not dot. You're like what? Feather, not dot. Well, at least, at, least, at least you're not Italian. <laughs> Actually, I was Sicilian when I grew up. There you go. There you, go. you uh, you didn't notice you were sitting next to Kim Thale from Soundgarden. <laughs> 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 That's a good one, though. I'm gonna keep that feather knot dot. I'm gonna. <laughs> is that the first time you ever heard that? It is. It is. How is that even possible? <laughs> you know. just weren't paying attention, honey. That's been around forever. <laughs> he was making music. Yeah. You know what's interesting to me, though? My, I, my, when I was um, from one to two and a half years old, we actually lived on a Cree Indian village in the Northwest Territory. My mom taught school, and it was like a. A Indian village mm-hmm. where the hunters still went out and hunted and they'd bring the kill back and everybody in the village would come and take their part and they would leave the best pieces yeah. for the hunters and it was like legit my mom yeah. had like amazing respect for Native Americans the whole time I was growing up so to me they were always on a pedestal like I, I it, it's almost like I'm just figuring out like oh in the documentary they were talking about a lot of if you were a dark skinned Native mm-hmm. American you would rather be thought of as black the Native American for a while in America because it was actually better 
to be a black person in America than it was to be a native person. I told in America. these guys. I told these guys that because um, my dad changed his last name to his stepfather's last name because um, he couldn't find work with an Indian surname. Yeah, it's really. I mean, and, I mean, we we know this, but then you don't. Quite, you know, it's you kind of think of the cowboy and Indian days, yeah. and then there's this whole period of our history after that that it was. The really, cinema really influenced the, the people the way people looked at Indians, especially yeah. when when cinema first started. The, the cowboy and Indian movies are like the first movies to come out, and um, yeah, so that's what my dad said exactly that that it was better to be black, and I couldn't pass for black. My birth certificate says Caucasian on it. Yeah. And uh, so he had an Indian surname, so he had to change it to his uh, stepfather's name. Because, you know, back then he was doing work at 14 years old. So yeah. he just switched over to uh, Perez sounds a lot better than yeah. an Indian surname. Yeah, it was mm. better to be. Do you know what that surname was? Cave. Cave. Hmm. Hmm. And um, <laughs> that doesn't sound that bad. It, sound it sounds like, cool. I mean, nowadays, it's like that wouldn't even matter. Man. Yeah, exactly. Is that the reason your dad was a big jazz fanatic? Mm-hmm. Because of that. Absolutely. Oh wow. And plus, he worked all like like I said, the Brown Derby and mm-hmm. oh, Moulin, shit, the Moulin the Rouge. Derby. Yeah. Yeah. No, he has a lot of roots in jazz. Me and him always talk about jazz. Yeah. Yeah. And it's little by little, I start getting to know more about his, you know, his father's history, and it's See, always my, my, amazes me. My father was a big fat guy, and he worked. Like every slave job in the kitchen, you know, mm-hmm. in the restaurant industry, and uh, but he's met a lot of jazz people like Coltrane. He's met he met all you know all the greats, and um, somewhere in my house there's a picture of um, I think it's Peter Lawford, Sammy Davis Jr., and Frank Sinatra, and they're lighting my dad's cigar. Oh uh, shit! <laughs> so, that bad. Nice. Yeah, crazy. Nice. Nice. That's cool. Nice. I was trying to get him to listen to. Um, I got a Charles Mingus. We just we Ooh, reorganized yeah. all of our vinyl, and I actually like. Mm-hmm. I'm start even as I get older too. I'm getting more into the kind of jazz that people go. That sounds terrible, <laughs> but, and I figured out what it is. Is you can't. It's not background music. It's like a ride. You got to get in the car mm-hmm. with the musicians, and you got to go with them. You got to be there and focus. And so I, I put the record on. I got Charles Mingus. I put it on, and he's like, "Geez, what?" <laughs> Turn that. Oh, that's Dude, because I'm like driving down the road. That's my ride, and her ride's like beep boop beep boop 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 boop. And I'm just like, what the fuck? I'm like, baby, you gotta sit down and listen to you, it. You also gotta get your jazz hands going too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you the but cigar. it's not all you gotta beautiful. Cigar it's, too. it's not always melodic and beautiful yeah. like we expect music. I to like be. big band jazz, like old school. Like, but there's sure. there are more songs, you know. And like I like, Miller. Yeah, I mean, I like, like that. Probably the it's probably like the quote unquote white stuff, but it's like I can I can get behind that. You know, my girl's been listening to Stan Getz. I'm like, turn off that white man jazz. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just like messing with her. Girl from oh, that's so snarly. Yeah. <laughs> I know that one too. I like that one too. Stan Getz. That's Stan Getz right there. What Stan wants, he gets. <laughs> So what's, what's next for you? I mean, um, do you have another film in the works, or do you plan on doing this any further? Mm. This is a great documentary. I think you got some great momentum. on it. Thank I mean, you. Yeah, we really Thank you. I, I don't think you should stop. I, I've been hearing that a lot. Um, it, was pretty, it was pretty overwhelming. It was a pretty overwhelming thing. I, I mean, I directed it. I produced it. I lit everything. I did the audio for everything. I'm kind of like a one-woman show. I did pay for an editor and then post-production. I had, you know, hired people to do all the post-production kind of stuff. But it's been pretty insane. I, I kind of want to take a little time. I always considered myself... I've discovered it. this this journey. I'm a storyteller. I like to tell stories, and I use different mediums. Sometimes I'm in a band. Sometimes it's artwork. Sometimes I'm a writer. Sometimes I'm a filmmaker. It's really kind of where I'm at in my life at the time. It's uh, documentaries. I loved it. It was a really cool, creative process. Um, but you suffer a lot for it, so it has to really be a story that you just are so in love with, or you, I, I couldn't imagine bleeding for it like you have to bleed for to make a good documentary, to be honest. And also, we have to, like, get our savings account. <laughs> Seriously, I was just going to say. Old, that man. was a challenge right there. So <laughs> you wouldn't do a Nickelback documentary, is what you're saying? <laughs> if, well, wait, listen, if Nickelback was like, Here's a couple hundred grand. 
and here's another hundred grand. That's your salary. Go ahead. Then we'd go. Mm, maybe she will. Yeah. I would say maybe she will. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be doing shit, but I would be kicking back on. I just think like to to. It's just like a band. If you've only got one toe in it, it's going to not be that great. If you want to make great art, you have to really be in love with the story that you're telling. So to me, it's, it's I don't know if it's an integrity thing or something. I mean, I mean Nickelback might said, have a good story. They might There might be some bitching story there, honey. The <laughs> don't, don't, you never know. Don't kick Nickelback to the curb without giving him a fair shot. We Coming might, soon, <laughs> the Nickelback story. By Jamie Sims. <laughs> we find a new love for them. <laughs> we, um, we were almost called quarterback. <laughs> and we decided to change it to nickelback. It was traumatic. <laughs> I would I would love to make another film. I just think I need a little break. Like I'm gonna do some traveling for the next I'm, I'm going to Machu Picchu in April wow. and then wow. awesome. going to Sri Always Lanka. wanted to visit. Yeah, next August because yeah. I haven't done any traveling and it was like my reward. I'm like, okay, if I survive making this documentary and this record I'm going to finally let myself spend a little money and go see some places that have been on you know on my mind so so that's kind of right now and then I think like any creative process you kind of have to take a breath and step back and get some perspective and then see where your heart leads you next Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not opposed to making another film and I have heard that it's been very gratifying a lot of people are like don't stop please make another film i can't wait to see what you do next and making music documentaries there's always the publishing rights Mm -hmm. and of the music issue which is a huge issue because the record labels are not in the business of giving out their their rights for free like the guy that made that one about the wrecking crew Mm -hmm. you know it took him so many years just to raise enough money to mm-hmm. license little snippets of Beach Boy songs and that crap, yeah. you know, because there's 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 actually been a couple, you know, uh, Bonnie Guitar would be one of them that mm-hmm. we were looking into. Bonnie Guitar is this amazing guitar player. She's like 93 or 94 years old. She's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. She was a session guitar player who... With a voice as good as Patsy Klein, maybe oh, wow. better. And wow. she had a hit out mm-hmm. at the same time as Patsy Klein, and then she it's called I mean, Dark Moon. She was the touring guitarist for the Grand Old Opry, a wow. woman. And in the in the in those days, like in what it was the '40s or mm-hmm. whatever it was, I mean, she I mean, she's had a million careers, but she also was a record producer. She owned a record label. She signed the Ventures, wasn't it the mm-hmm. Ventures? Wow. And all wow. these crazy things, you know. A but bat, she was a badass woman when you mm-hmm. just it was really hard to be a badass woman yeah. but and she was from, all from uh, my family's native home of Washington State she was from that area mm-hmm. in eastern Washington too so there was like the, all of these things about it that I really liked but again trying to track down the rights trying to track down the music mm-hmm. you know that kind mm-hmm. of thing it's it's you know it's a it's a you're, you're in it for four or five years minimum I mean we made the stock from start to finish and got it out in under four years that's Unreal. That's really good. And we did that because the Cadillac Tramps fans mm-hmm. stepped up and helped us. And find you had it. a passion for it too. It right. shows you had a lot of passion. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we, it's, we it's I really wanted Gabby to get to yes. see it. I, and I wanted them all to get to see it together. So mm-hmm. that was some. You know, I was like, I can't stop. I can't stop. Many, I mean, many, it, many, many sixteen-hour days. <laughs> if the rec, if the recording industry would get on board with it and notice that it was it actually is a great tool yeah. to get your mm-hmm. music out there mm-hmm. to sell maybe sell some of these reissue some of these albums that mm-hmm. they and if they could really do that they'd probably fund a lot more and i think they do from time to time mm-hmm. but it's so haphazard and with bonnie i think her career spanned so many different record labels and so many different mm-hmm. things it would just be this huge nightmare but it's a story that it's a compelling story for sure. So oh, yeah. the last eight months of the documentary was basically paperwork for me. Mm-hmm. It was oh, that getting all, all of, the legal fees. getting all of the, all yeah. the legal contracts and the Eclipse mm-hmm. licensed, and you know, there's a thing called coverage. Mm-hmm. He's always like, "You can't don't talk about that. Nobody knows what that means." But you know, we had archival footage, and then we had interview footage, and you use that every time somebody pauses too long in a sentence or you, when you're cutting your dialogue together yeah. you can't just leave a blank space on the screen there has to be something <laughs> yeah, to yeah. cover that edit mm-hmm. and people don't realize that so 
you have to pull your license, all kinds of stuff to cover those gaps. And that was really, a, that was one, like one of the hardest things to do. And then we had, my editor had put uh, some clips from Pulp Fiction in oh. the original Cezanne. Yeah, I saw nice. that. <laughs> and yeah, we left it, that. and we left it, and everybody said, don't worry about it, it's filtered, nobody's going to, you know, we didn't even know if it was going to be a decent movie when we did that. Yeah. So, you know, it was like, whatever, we'll deal with it later. And that was like, maybe, I don't know, two months, two months, three months before we were supposed to put it out, I'm like, I, I got to... I got to do something. That, it was keeping me up at night. Like, I'm going to get sued by Miramax. Oh, my God. It's going to ruin me. <laughs> so I was walking with my son, and he's like, why don't you just try and license it? And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. So I actually ended up, and they were really cool about it. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's like a, a little like three-second snippet from Pulp Fiction yeah. in there that I actually Absolutely. licensed from Remax. But <laughs> stupid stuff that you don't think of. I mean, I spent way too much money on a three-second clip because mm -hmm. I would have had to go back in and open up the whole cut and ugh. Which would have cost more money. Which so would have cost like, ten, yeah. you know, six grand to pay the editor and redo the... Yeah, it's, okay. it's a nightmare, so... Yeah, yeah, docs are really hard for that mm -hmm. for that main reason. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask you that, too, because I was going to ask you, um, is there anything you missed that you wish you had put in there? <laughs> no, I didn't have enough. I didn't really have enough footage. I think oh, people wow. people are posting stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. Yeah, today. You should have put this in. You should have put that in. Like today. That. My, wow. friend, my friend Christy, I hope she listens to this. She posted like this. She pulled out all this. And she's got ticket stubs from certain shows and all oh, this wow. crap. And it was Damn. like, dude, we were posting like 50 million times. Hey, send in your, let us know if you have some like flyers or take pictures. whatever. Take pictures of it and send it to us and blah, blah, blah. I think I just saw like a 30 minute clip about uh, Bill Clinton saying how great the Cadillac Triumph were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously. Remember? I mean, come on, yeah. That, that could have been useful. <laughs> he was like up there. He played saxophone with us. <laughs> no, but it really was like that. And and we, all my interviews were done, and I was like ready to to be cutting the film. And I didn't have hardly any archival. I had not gotten any. We didn't save. <clears throat> Gabby didn't save. Nobody saved anything. Johnny kept saying, I think I got a box in my garage that's got some stuff in it. I'll pull it out one day. And then he goes off on tour with Social Distortion for six months. And so there was this really long period where I was like, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish this movie. We just don't have enough archival We had like footage. a guy from Toronto who sent us some stuff. Wow. And, <sighs> After the you know. So finally wow. I'm like, Johnny, please, will you go dig in your garage and see if you can find that? I don't care. Any, anything. I need anything. And so at some point he had had a girlfriend that had made photo the old school photo albums he had three big photo albums of photos and he had four vhs tapes that were wow. compilations of a oh, bunch wow. of different shows oh, wow. over the years that, wow. that were sitting in his garage and i'm like just Gold save mine. i mean it saved up. me Dang. it saved me i would have never been able to to do the coverage for it without that i still like thank you john i'll <laughs> tell you that uh that that opening uh, live clip um, on the preview oh, for yeah. uh, Life mm -hmm. on the Edge. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. You too. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was an awesome clip. Yeah, that yeah. was weird because that was like, we were popular in Canada to a degree where, you know, our, our manager calls and he's like, okay, the television station is going to come down and they're going to come and film your show and then you're going the next day and you're going to load into the studio and you're going to do an in-studio. That was like a tel that was a television show in wow. Canada. Like wow. we we're on TV oh, wow. kind of crap. Yeah. So it was a whole different level once you got into Canada for us. It was crazy. But that was one of those. There's the footage of them where they're skiing and snowboarding. And yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that TV station. <laughs> oh, okay. But they yeah, had cut it to the, hey, hey, we're the monkeys. <laughs> and it was oh, genius. Wow. And I'm wow. like, I can't afford to license, hey, hey, they're the monkeys. So we had some great friends band. The hula Girls. The Hula Girls and Brian's like, you know what? I think the Hula Girls have a song that might we might that might work. So we asked them, can we have that song? Yeah. And then we had to go in and recut that to it because I'm like, there's no way we can afford to license. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys for this. Like, oh, no. and it, you don't not license. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, you can't do that if you're gonna release it on any. It's like, hey, hey, we're the tramps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. 
<laughs> We're all just trapping around. <laughs> Seriously. It was actually way better cut to hey, hey, we're the monkeys. But you know what? It's pretty good to longboard. You got to do what you got to do to not get sued. <laughs> I, li- I like that you guys did that because it, it, you, you guys like got out the, what you guys did on the side. You know, it wasn't just the music. You showed like your extracurricular activities that you guys messed around. You know, because I, yeah. I used to love snowboarding before. So it took me back to that, you know, when you're out there working and doing whatever, you know what, let's go have fun. Yeah. yeah. That's what it showed to me when you guys, when I seen that footage. Well, it was weird for us because they go, you guys want to go skiing or snowboarding or whatever? And we go, oh, we don't really have any gear. And they're like, just go to the shop, go to the rental shop. And they they hooked us all up. Like, you want to snowboard? You want to ski? Okay, blah, blah, blah. But then we were like... I don't even have any gloves. They go, well, look in the lost and found over here, eh? <laughs> and we, like, raided the lost and found. So it was like, oh, I got two gloves that don't match and shit, you know? And then, and then we're, like, on the hill, and people are looking at us, and we're wearing, like, black hoodies and shit. They're like, who in the fuck are these guys? It's like the late and then 80s. cameras are following us. <laughs> and and Gabby, Gabby had two pairs of pants on. And the outer pair of Levi's never made it down the hill, man. <laughs> he fell so many times that that shit gets ripped off, completely ripped. Uh, he never went more than like I'd say I'd say like five feet, like zhoosh, boom, zhoosh, boom. It's, it's not like skateboarding. No, <laughs> Jamie Reedling was the piece. only one who could actually snowboard and did it. Nice. He just ditched him though, though. And me and Johnny ski. It's like he's like in the ski lift because he's like, "Fuck you, suckers! I'm gonna go ski for snowboard well, for free." <laughs> I got screwed that day because I'm I, I could ski kind of. I got skis. Johnny got skis. Turns out there was this country western dude that was he was playing shows too, so he was with us as well. But they didn't, you know, he wasn't in the film because obviously he wasn't there with us. But he goes, uh, "Hey, let's go, man! Let's go up to the top." And we're all, I'm all like, okay. We all just jump on. We go up to the top to like a black diamond At run. Whistler. And wow. Two Bags lived in Mammoth for a while. So Two Bags could ski really pretty good. And this cow, this country western dude was just like, I'm Canadian. Yeah, I might be playing country western, but I'm a Canadian. And freaking, they just like, and I'm up on the top. I literally rode down some of those no gloves. Oh, My freaking hands were just oh red. Oh, God. And, uh. I rode down some of those black diamond moguls on my butt just to get, <laughs> after, you know, it was like, not die. they never showed me. You, you notice, you don't see me once in that whole skiing thing because I was just wet and pissed off. And like, <laughs> hurting. Like, this is fucked. Get out of here. You're going to feel it the next day. Oh, man, it sucked. So basically, you and Sonny Bono hate skiing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he, he hates it a little more, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Take it politically. Be politically correct over there. <laughs> also, um, this is probably a good way to end this um, interview. Um, Brian and I are going to the Saints Rams game tomorrow. I am a Saints fan. I'm, I'm going to ignore the flag. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh-oh. So I hope you guys still want to air this interview now that you know the truth about that's okay. it. <laughs> that's a different, it's a whole different conference, man. And you know what? I saw your post about parking. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a nightmare. Really? Yeah, yeah it's a nightmare. It's We're a thinking about just and, Uber yeah, and all the time. Uber. Yeah, Uber. Yes, Uber. Yeah, Uber. Or you know what? You know, you could even uh, take the metro. Yeah, take the metro. But yeah, hey, right even now. even the metro's got some issues, man. <laughs> at certain stops along the way, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I would I would definitely Uber it because uh, aside from the sea of cars, you're gonna have a sea of people just everywhere. I mean, it is ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. I'm yeah. excited. Saints are doing good this year. Yeah, they are. They're looking mm-hmm. so the good. The Rams are too, so it could be yeah. a good game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll be a good game. We are now. I have no idea football. what you guys are talking about. <laughs> I don't know anything of sports. No, well, that's okay. He loves to watch home runs over there. <laughs> watch the football game. <laughs> yeah, see. That three-pointer. Trust me. That's yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what kind of baseball game your guys are going in tomorrow. So. It's lacrosse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> What about that sports ball team we all like? 
<laughs> that football contest you guys are going to tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know, though. He starts trying to talk to me about divisions, and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that team's here, and the other team's here. Why are they in the same division? Like, Why is Dallas in the Eastern Division? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait, somebody like was in the smoking middle. something when they yeah. decided all that, but I think yeah. it's because the teams all move around over time or something, but it's a... It nice, has something like, to do with synchronized care. swimming. I know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, the Dallas Cowboys started out on the East Coast and migrated west. <laughs> I stick to, I just stick to Kings hockey, man. There you LA go. Kings, that's just, my bread. That's yeah. that's my thing. I would have never known you're a Kings fan. <laughs> <laughs> And a Slayer fan, I wouldn't know that either. Die hard, right? Here. A King Slayer. <laughs> the King Slayer. Okay. That's the new band name, King yeah, Slayer. King Slayer huh? Seriously. Influenced my, my, by Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and uh, my, oh my, my, my last question goes out to Joel. Uh, who got you to Slayer? <laughs> <laughs> this scumbag right here. Oh. We were in uh, high school. Nice. I was the music pimp of the group. I got everybody hip oh, on stuff. Oh, there you go. Well, yeah, because yeah. that's your dad, right? Yeah, for everything. Yeah. yeah. Come down the pike. He had the guitar. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> he, uh, he gave me a uh, Soundgarden tape, and he goes, hey, this is a band I used to be in. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you use that with the ladies too. Uh, I know, I'm very much taken. Uh, I used to be in a band. W- which band? Soundgarden. I'm the guitar player. Look. <laughs> this is me. Oh, so uh, we should tell everybody to go to the December 15th uh, thingamajiggy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> thingamajiggy. That yeah, deep piazzas, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah we're actually we're actually pajamas. going to that. Oh, oh cool. We, we had Sloka. Yeah. We had Sloka on the last We're podcast. passing out stickers and, and Awesome. Um, yeah. Nice. Okay, so it's December fifteenth. Mm-hmm. It's a benefit, right? Yeah, we play early, like eight, so what's it a benefit wants. for? Uh Shriners Hospital. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's a good which cause. is a great cause because right. you know I guess I can show up to that. We have friends that have been directly have directly benefited from um you know some of the some of the good natured people over there at the mm-hmm. absolutely the masons and the shriners and all that and we should tell you guys if you want to see the documentary you can uh see it on itunes or amazon or voodoo you can stream it or buy it and i do think that my distributor film buff is going to have dvds um they're gonna start printing up dvds on demand for people so I'll, we should know about that in the next couple of weeks and also yes. you can go to cadillac tramps documentary.com and there's all kinds of merch there there's also the double vinyl album that we've been talking about and then the uh the new cadillac tramps live. off their walkers is going to be a <laughs> digital download available there in the next couple of weeks too but we're getting some cool we're getting coffee mugs oh nice we're gonna get a cadillac tramps coffee mug i'm actually stoked about that <laughs> you guys are you guys selling it out in the record store anytime? It's at Amoeba right now, oh, and nice. I'm gonna. I need to go. I just have been lagging. I need to go and get it in fingerprints. Amoeba's actually got like five copies, of, or they did. I, I dropped off um, like ten copies of the vinyl and five so of I'm the DVD at Amoeba on Hollywood yeah. Boulevard. So yeah, this vinyl. guy's a hoarder. Yeah, uh, I'm a vinyl. Of, I'm a vinyl. Of vinyl. Yeah. It's really good. I'm gonna buy it. The so artwork's I'm amazing. I'm probably gonna leave it's after so this and go buy it. He um, wanted to ask. He, he wanted. He um. He asked me. He's like, "Hey, can they bring one so I could buy it right now?" <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I would have. We were getting ready to leave, and I, I said, "Do we need to one. bring anything?" And he's like, "Oh no, come on, we're running late." <laughs> I definitely would have bought it. Yeah. I well, we just drop you off one. All right. Cool. Um, but yeah, and Amiibo was funny. I went in there and was you know because it's consignment based, and I'm telling. I'm like, oh, I have this album and this dvd and i'm pretty and she's like yeah and she's like well, what's the band and i'm like oh, the cadillac tramps and she's like oh shit bring it in <laughs> nice. well, that'll do great here so it was like funny i'm like i should have led with that so <laughs> just like i'm some random person trying to sell you stuff so but yeah so that's kind of cool i actually want to go by and take pictures i love to see the stuff in this in the record stores nice. while they're still here I've seen it in fingerprints is not a bad spot. I, I was just there last week. Yeah. yeah. I meant to get some in for because yesterday was record store. Yes, record store yeah. day. And I just didn't I just didn't 
I couldn't pull it off. I was baking pies and bread. <laughs> good, good record stores are hard to find nowadays. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be record store day yeah, right. soon. Exactly. <laughs> it's so yeah. fun though. I, I never one? regret <laughs> going in. I, do you guys? I never regret making the trek, going and mm-hmm. flipping through vinyl or looking. At, I always feel so good when I do that. Like it's just the energy in those rooms are always so right. great. I go like, why do I not do this more often? Mm, yeah. I spend Such hundreds, hundreds of dollars a month on them. So it's it's an addic- It's a good addiction. It yeah. is. He goes to Goodwill stores and. Go to the cage. Oh, that's the thing. Every man. Goodwill I see, I stop and buy something. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. that's when you get the good deals. Oh, too. yeah. Two bucks. You can't beat it. Yeah. yeah. I always find the hidden gems at the Goodwill. I got Miles at Newport for 35 cents. What? Nice. Yeah, 1940 something, 39. 35 cents? 35 cents. I got from the from the Goodwill. Not uh, in Los Angeles. In when you Linwood. pull it out, though, and you yeah. go oh, and you can really? just tell, like, oh, this That's person. T- it's all Nobody nice. Nobody listened no to this. <laughs> <laughs> you need, then you pull it out, and it's like, this must have been at the Coakley's house when he was younger, because <laughs> our album would just be laying all over the freaking floor. He still does Dusty. that in my house. I get so mad. I'm like, damn it, put the records back. <laughs> put them back. I do. I have layers. Oh, I have a song idea. I have a song idea. Out, yeah. <laughs> he gets inspired, you know, and then he has to run and pick mm-hmm. up his guitar. I have a thing where I, when I buy my record, I don't play it right away. I, I go to my pad and I leave it there. I let it sit there for maybe a week. Oh. And let it be part of the home. Oh. And then I play. Really? That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. It, it is, is cool weird. though. Actually. Because I, I want it to be, I want I it to be fit in. Weird. You know, I want it to be fit in yeah. in the home. And then, okay, you're part of. Okay, welcome. Yeah. You know, so that yeah. early forties record it. I gave you, you haven't listened nope. to yet. No. Nope. <laughs> it takes right it out. Oh. Takes it out for That's a walk. Good. He respects yeah. it. That's right. Yeah. Take, takes it out for a walk. He has it a, when he brings it back in. The new vinyl smell. <laughs> the new vinyl smell. Boy, they try and tell you that digital sounds as good as vinyl, but no. I don't. I, I can feel the difference. There's not something coming crackle. off the vinyl yes. that's not coming off the digital. Mm-hmm. Off my eye. My it has soul. I have the soul to it. Yeah, and yeah. um, he did a. I've been listening to stream music for for a year already, mm-hmm. and he did a mix with nothing but vinyl. He did what was it was hour and twenty mix. Mm-hmm. It's an hour and twenty of like um all this funk music. Mm, I want that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll uh, trade you. <laughs> yeah, we'll, email we'll, we'll, we'll email you the the track. Yeah. It's called Drumming, and it's 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 completely amazing. But he did it all vinyl, and it sounded way louder, way mm. clearer, just because it was just recorded from uh, what was it Cubase you're using? Uh, no, I was uh, Studio One. A studio mm. One. I, I direct. I, no, actually, sorry, it was Audacity. It went into Audacity. But from really Audacity from, to his turntables. No, oh. no, from the turntables to Audacity. Yeah. Mm. With no editing, nothing. It was just straight. And you could hear the crackles there. Yeah, yeah. And what it a, sounds deep, like the, the warmth of it to the kick, when the kick and the snare is. You could tell. People ask me, they're like, it sounds different. What is it? Like, it's all vinyl. Yeah, it's vinyl. Is it like a, what do you use, like Roxio? Or what are your what are your inputs as to um, convert it? Uh, it was Audacity. My friend, uh, he had Audacity. The weird thing is I my computer didn't work that day. So I went to his house. Oh. I grabbed about probably like 50 vinyl, you know, 50 records. Yeah. Went to his house and I go, hey, man, I need to record this. He's like, yeah, I have Audacity, so you can record it directly in there. So cool. And I, it's all live. Sounds great. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I'll send you guys a link. I, you yeah, know. I'd love to. Yeah. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. It's weird because you can put it to digital after you take it off of the vinyl and mm-hmm. it sounds good because the digital captures kind of yes. what you're hearing. Mm-hmm. With no effects. But if they first do it on the vinyl, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's weird. And it's all stuff from, you know, the 70s and 60s. Mm-hmm. So it's, well, it's they were spending some money to make that music oh, yeah, back yeah, then yeah. too. Yeah, well, they weren't cheaping yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that, they were um, they were letting the artists experiment mm-hmm. from what they did. They weren't they weren't controlling. Right. The producer didn't have his big thumb in the soup. Yeah. Exactly. Like I have a yeah. <clears throat> in that mix. You guys will hear it. There's a Lou Reed song oh. in there, and it's like it's straight from vinyl. It sounds so nice. Mm. Then from here in the radio or CD. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can tell the difference. What was the band that Lou Reed was in? Velvet Underground. Velvet yeah, Underground. I actually have. Vel- I did. I have Velvet Underground on vinyl, and it was sounded fantastic. I was never that into him, and then I like p- like picked it up at a thrift store or something, and I'm like, oh, I like this song. And then I listen to the thing, I'm like, ah, oh, this is great. <laughs> so uh, let's say our goodbyes. Um, I'm with uh, Brian Coakley and his wife Jamie Sims. I'm Chris. This is Rick. Rick. <laughs> I'm Boggle. And I'm Joel. I'm Jamie. I'm Brian. <laughs> And uh, this is a, this is a, the last bit of the podcast. Spontaneous. Thank you guys so much for having oh, us. It was yeah, a great conversation. You. And uh, go out there and see Cadillac Traps Life on the Edge. This talk is 
truly a must see. It's genuine in every sense of the word. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right. Thank, Thank you. You guys are welcome here anytime. <coughs> if you got any, got anything new to plug, right. you know. Yeah.